welcome to Forbidden Planet TV, uh, where I'm privileged today to be joined by one of our all-time favourite authors, none other than the magnificent Earl <laughs> K. Hamilton, the <laughs> long-running Anita Blake Vampire Hunter series, and um, one of our uh, and the amazing Mary Gentry series, two of our favourite novel series at Forbidden Planet. Um, it's it's wonderful to have you here, mate. Thank you for joining us at Forbidden Planet TV. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for that lovely, lovely introduction. That's awesome. Oh, well, absolutely well deserved. And uh, everybody's very excited that I was getting the chance to speak to you today. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, drew, I drew the long story, as it were. And um, I, we're here specifically to talk about your 28th, I believe, uh, novel in the mm -hmm. Anita Blake series, uh, which is Raphael, right there, which you can order from the links attached to this video. Yes, and it's the lovely, uh, the lovely British cover. I mean, I'm lucky that I have uh, great covers, uh, both, uh, both in, the, both in the United Kingdom. Yes, indeed. United Kingdom and and over here. But uh, this is the one for for that you will be ordering for Forbidden Planet. This is the cover. Yeah, that's right. The, published by our friends at Headline, and uh, yes. as I said, available right here for order. Beautiful cover. Um, what can you tell us about this uh, latest edition in Anita Blake's Adventures? Well, um, one of the one of the interesting things is uh, I was putting together the book before the Sucker Punch, and I had just. That's a great book, by the way. That was great. Thank you Loved very it. much. Uh, that was the scheduled one. And we had just finished, uh, I was about to start edits with my editor and then the world changed and everything happened. And uh, suddenly New York was shut down. Everything changed for my editor. I was very lucky. I had my home office here. So for me, life, life was almost the same, but the editing process totally changed. But one of the things I kept hearing from fans is how much raw, uh, Sucker Punch coming out really helped them. It helped them be able to read. It helped them to escape. And I thought, okay, I, what can I do? What can I do? Well, I'm a writer, writer's right. And so I thought, okay, guys, what do you want to see? If I, could, if I could manage this, if I could do another book, do a quick turnaround, what would you want? And a lot of people have been wanting to see Raphael on stage. Raphael is the king of the were rats and he is the only uh, shapeshifter that has been, he was started in Guilty Pleasures and he is the only one, there were no werewolves or, or, or were leopards. There were just the were rats and guilty pleasures, the first book. And now I finally get to have Raphael and all the were rats on stage in a major, major way. Fans wanted it. And, and I have, it was so fun to do all the world building. Um, I got to bring out my research books. I got to dive deep in a way that I hadn't been able to put on stage. Um, and I really was able to create their world and, and it, I'm so, it was really good timing because I could not have written this book or couldn't have written the, the fight scenes, the action scenes as well as I did. Had I not, I am, uh, I've been in Filipino martial arts for over three years Interesting. and, and I am fifth level in Kali, which is a uh, sword. It can be stick sword or knife, it's, it's the weaponry. Yeah. Um, one of the things FMA does uh, is it, it lets you stick, stick. it puts something in your hands as a, as a weapon first and then you do empty hand. And I learned better that way. Everything else once you do empty hand first without teaching you, and I've done a lot of martial arts, but that was always awkward to me. Going backwards, I've never been better at empty hand in my life because somehow about doing it with, with weaponry, then translates better for me doing it empty hand. So it's as if doing it with a weighted object gives you a yes. sense of balance and, uh, and you know, that between your hands, you know, and that sense of coordination throughout your body, it helps with that. I have never thrown better than in my life. I wish I was this good at gym when I was back in school because I was not. I, it's, it's really helped my coordination altogether. Because um, you know, Khalid crosses the barriers. It uses both hands, and I think there's something about that, about using both hemispheres physically more often. Something about Khalid really 
I, I catch better. I have better balance. I, I just, it's, it's like, it just really speaks to me. That's and, so interesting. and, uh, the, the were rats have always been, uh, Hispanic, uh, are, you know, I, hard to keep up with the vocabulary, but, uh, Hispanic, but, but in doing my research on Filipino martial arts, cause I research everything I do, I found that there was a very strong uh, connection with Spain in the Philippines. And you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. And so it was very interesting. It just came together and, and it, is, it is both uh, Hispanic, Spanish culture and it is also Filipino culture. And I hope to do more of it. I really enjoyed being able to show everyone how much more in depth because the were rats are the only ones that have kept their heritage. They yeah. haven't, they haven't been taken over by anybody else. They haven't been watered down. They are very, very much their own people in their own culture. Um, and it was really fun. It was so fun to finally put it on stage. And Raphael really came into his own. Um, it, he's kind of been a side, I call them a major minor characters because there are no minor characters, not really. And it was just, and I also got to have uh, Claudia, who is uh, a wear rat, one of his bodyguards and, and one of his lieutenants and uh, have her on stage. And it was very fun to have this many women and female characters on stage at once. Uh, so, so that was fun. I got to do a lot of first things. And, and when you're 28 novels into a series, to be able to hit so many firsts is so fun. Um, I get people asking, even, even people that are writing series themselves, and they say, how do you keep it interesting? How, how are you still having this much fun? And I said, because I keep growing and changing along with my characters, I keep learning new things, and so do they. It's not static, just like the rest of us. Yeah, I, 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 th I think that's so true. What I've always felt, incidentally, by the way, your point about... Uh... Uh, about the Philippines is just, it's just uh, so well made. Uh, a very close friend of mine is a Filipino American, and his surname is Enriquez, right? You know, and uh, yes. just, uh, and uh, I, I didn't realize until I knew him how much of a crossover there was with those cultures. And it, it, I think I think one of the things that's really interesting about your work is 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 how how illuminating it actually is for a series of fancy fancy novels about the things that surround us in the real world and about the history of the real world and the cultures of the real world. And, and as to your point about the, the, the novels being so long running, uh, one of the things that I, I personally admire about your work is that um, one of the other things I do, my role here at Titan is I, is I edit some of our, um, our noir fiction, uh, which is a, a personal interest of mine, PI novels and whatnot. And of course, in the world of like crime and noir fiction, it's very common to have series that can be written over the course of somebody's life and run to 40, 50, you know, books or what have you. So, you know, guys like the Robert B. Parkers and, and, yes. the, and the Max Allen Collins and, and the Lawrence Blocks, you know. And I think it is, to my mind, it is less common you know, within the fantasy arena where, where you tend yeah. not to get series that run that long. But I think the beauty of committing to a character or a pool of characters over that period of time is it just allows a wealth of, of storytelling opportunities and changing, growing perspectives, which is, of course, what real life is like. And I think that's absolutely what you've captured with you, with both of your series. Uh, yeah, exactly. Actually, Robert B. Parker, I uh, call him... The, the kind of the grand kind of the grandfather of Anita because uh, I discovered film uh, uh, hardboiled detective fiction after college and you can still hear the echo of Robert B. Parker Spencer in my dialogue and through him I discovered Dashiell Hammett and in in the original original hardboiled detective uh, fiction. And you could still hear the echo of it. So, so Spencer, the Spencer series was very, very solidly pivotal in, in helping me create my voice for Anita. I, I'm so glad that I asked you that question because I've always heard that cadence in your dialogue and I just thought it was me projecting, to be honest. So, yeah. uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing too because, of course, the great thing about Parker was 
his hero is not a lone wolf. His hero is in a functional, mature adult relationship with the person yes. that he loves, uh, and which was very much a, a very much a new thing when he introduced it into into PI fiction in the seventies, right? And uh, yeah. there's a reality to his work, I think, uh, for that reason. I I absolutely agree. Uh, and before Parker's Spencer series. The, the male detective in, in the hard boiled, the, 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 the film noir kind of thing, they would be a love him and leave him kind of guy. You know, you'd have the lady for that book, but you usually never saw them again. That's right, exactly. The, the James Bond scenario, which I know Bond isn't noir, but the same thing, you know, a different. Well, it, some, of the, some of the James Bond's books have a very noir feel to them. Oh yeah, I know. I I I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I think, but, but it is not solidly no, in I, the genre. No. And they have some wild fancy about them as well. I think, which is uh, <laughs> you know, and, and of course, like uh, you know, Fleming and uh, Chandler knew each other. I think Chandler was a big supporter of Fleming's career at the beginning there. But to flip back to your fine work, and actually now that we're in, into this, I would love to ask you about uh, um, uh, on the Mary Gentry series, who is of course a private investigator. Um, what was what was the what was the genesis of your two key series? How did you how did you kick off both of them? Where did they come from? Uh, well, Anita came out of reading hard boiled detective fiction after college. Um, I had also moved from the Midwest where I grew up, and was in LA. I I used to think thirty thousand people was a big city, and then I moved to LA. Los Angeles and it culture shock doesn't begin to cover it. It really doesn't. So I knew nobody, uh, you know, I, I did move my, my, uh, my first husband, ex-husband, I never know how to say that. Um, of course we moved together, but I, it was just very different, very lonely, very isolating because you didn't know anybody, you didn't have your family. And so I did what I'd always done. I read and one of the things I found, and, and you can tell me if you disagree, but at that time, women, women in the mystery genre of hard boiled and men in the mystery genre both had very different things. The men could cuss, they could say bad language, they could kill casually without feeling bad, they could womanize and have sex on paper. And the women rarely if ever had any foul language in them. The characters, no matter how strong they were, still had, uh, if they killed anybody, they had to feel really, really bad about it. They weren't allowed the level of violence and sex was non-existent. Or it was very, very off stage for the women. And it's like, why are we at this point in modern society, this uneven? And I thought I wanted to create a character that would even the playing field. And thus Anita Blake was born. Now I may have overcompensated just a little on evening the playing field. <laughs> Um, particularly as you went along, as you went along in the series, yeah. Particularly as, um, but I thought a straight mystery series, I thought I would get bored. And one of the things I found in reading is that a lot of series, not all, but between book five and book eight, they get bored with their own creations and you can tell. Now, some people go away from the series character, but they'll have a slump about there and then they rise and they fall back in love, hopefully. But I didn't want to do that. I thought, well, what could I do to make this most interesting to me? So I thought I've always loved monster movies and uh, folklore and scary stories from my childhood. So I thought, what if I combine hard-boiled detective fiction and all that goes bump in the night? I thought that sounds interesting. And indeed, that has been a big enough world to keep me interested this whole time. So, um, and I also made the choice not to keep my character static, which some mystery series do. Yeah. The, the characters never get a, is Spencer, they don't get a relationship. They don't yeah. have a small cast of characters that never changes with them. And after that, it's they, but they don't change. Yeah. They just stay the same. Um, and it has. Uh, so that's where Anita came from. And then, uh, then Mary, Mary Gentry came from the fact that I, I wanted to write, I'd written at that point, maybe six, five or six Anita Blake novels in a row. And I thought I wanted to write something different. I wanted to have a different, different voice out there. Um, 
And I had several ideas that I put together and I, I ran them by uh, my editor and this was the one that was most interesting to everybody. And the interesting, it took me years to realize where, where Mary came from. Uh, Mary is a, is a fairy tale with, that doesn't work. She is, the, the, the fairy tale is not as pretty as it looks on the outside. And um, I don't know, this may, be, I, I don't know, I had a therapy breakthrough just, just this year about where Mary came from. And um, I came up with the idea of the Marriage Interest Series at the end of my first marriage when I, I didn't realize, I knew things were going badly. And this was the first love of my life, uh, the little white dress, the white picket fence. I bought the whole nine yards. It wasn't working. And I realized years and years later that, that I wanted to create a fairy story, a fairy tale that showed that it, it's how dangerous it is and how it doesn't work the way you plan. So I now know that that's where Mary <laughs> came from. And I kind of, I had a moment of realization. I went, oh, and then I went, oh, okay. Mary is a grown up fairy tale telling you that Fairy tales do not work the way you think they will, but it still works. And you can still find happiness, but not in the way you expect it. So it is very much a grown up take on the traditional fairy tale. And I am planning, I am planning. So I will say this, and uh, I am in the middle of editing a new book and a new series, which will, the plan is to come out this summer, but I am hope, and then one more Anita book, and then I'm hoping after that that I will do another Mary. Great, fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm planning to do another Mary, and um, I can't say anything else. It's too yeah. far. It's too far out. But but I want to do justice to Mary and all the characters because it's such a great world. It, it it's such a great world. It's, it's such a rich world. Part of me with Mary. Part of me almost wants to 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 find somebody to to play with some of the minor major characters and, and hive off because the world is so big. It's like, how do I play? How do I get enough time to play in all my worlds? Yeah. I mean, um, I, I think that's what the epitome of a champagne problem, right? Which is you have these two beautifully realized universes. Some, some people don't get half of that, you know, and to have both of them, I'm sure it's a scheduling issue, juggling, being able to explore them both. Well, what if, one, of, one of the best thing, Writers seem to come in two categories. There are writers who struggle to get a good, good ideas, book length ideas, and, and really they struggle and they get a few ideas. If they get one good idea, one good series, then they're lucky because they're, they don't come up with a lot of ideas. I'm, I'm the other kind of writer. I have so many ideas for so many series and so many short stories. I would have to live to like 320 at this point to just get them all down. And that is not just all the Anita ideas or all the Mary ideas or all the new series or everything that, that I, I have, if I had more time in the day, if I had a time turner like in Harry Potter, um, I have yet another idea for another series. And, and, and it's just, you just literally, you don't have enough hours in the day. Plus I want to have a life, you know, I have a family. I, I, you know, I have my wonderful husband um who and my daughter and due to things being what they are she is doing finishing up college long distance so she's home and uh you know i'm trying to actually have a life outside my office and outside pages but it's most art is all consuming if it's really your calling and so for me the writing is very much it at its best, it's all consuming. I, I did not, I was not conscious when I created Mary exactly where she came from. I knew I wanted another mystery series. Mystery, really, if you ask me what I write, I don't say that I write fantasy. I actually say, I, I'm actually a mystery writer that happens to work in fantasy and horror. It's, but, but almost all the books I've ever written have as their spine a mystery. And so really I'm a mystery writer that just, happens to do horror and fantasy and dark fantasy and some people have called Anita science fiction like it's an alternative world and I can see that some people say it's romance though um 
some of the romance people say, you know, that the violence level is a little high for them. So it's, it's interesting with the fan base being as wide as it is that people all find something and then they'll find something else that they kind of, they kind of take it with what they want. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but you know, I, I love what I do. It's, and I am very lucky as you said, a champagne problem to be able to do what I want to do since I was a little girl and make a living at it and support my family and everything. That's, that's a great gift. I work really hard, but still there are a lot of people that are really good writers that don't get this chance. Part of it is that I did have an idea that other people wanted to read. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, you, you get to entertain so many people in the process. I, I think it's a, a highly virtuous circle. On on that note, I think that that's that's a, a brilliant note on which which to close out and, and to say that Laurel, it's been such a pleasure chatting to you about your career, about the Anita Blake series, about the Mary Gentry series, and about the publication of Raphael, book twenty eight, oh. in the Anita Blake series. Is this my cue to hold it up again? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly right. Yeah, spot on. There we go. And there it is in, in all its glory, which you can order from the links attached right here, available from yes. forbiddenplanet.com right now. Thanks so much for joining us today, Laura. Oh, you're welcome. It was wonderful. And I uh, hope everybody stays safe, warm, and happy where they are. Yeah, and the very same to you. And uh, um, please come back and visit us again when you've got your next book coming out. Happy to do so. Yeah. Take care of yourself. All the very best. You too. Bye-bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.